Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. In this video we're going to be looking at another proof. This time we're going to be proving a very, very intuitive statement that's going to be very, very difficult to prove, which is that if the set of A equals the set of B, then if and only if, that's true if and only if A equals B. And the proof. Let's take a look. So, in this video, we're going to prove another very intuitive claim about sets that we have taken for granted so far, and we've talked about our brackets in this way without ever proving that this is the case. But it's going to be important moving forward, as will the last proof that we did. This is the claim that the set of A and the set of B are identical if and only if A is identical to B. All right. Formerly, we will state that for all classes A, B, C, and D, where A has as its only member C and B has as its only member D, A equals B if and only if C equals D. Hopefully that makes sense as a kind of formalization of that general statement. Basically, to make this make sense, we, want to, we need to specifically define each of those sets that are in brackets and so we're defining the set of c or the class of c as a and the class of d as b and then showing that those are equal to each other because otherwise it'll get messy we could have just done the proof as it was but i like to do it this way to be really clear with what we're doing and because this will be a useful thing to instantiate later on all right I encourage you, please try proving this on your own, especially if you haven't tried proving other things. At least give it a try. If you get stuck along the way, you can try it along with me in just a second. So, here's the conclusion we're trying to get to. Now, often in these videos, I like to do indirect proofs uh, just because those are very intuitive for me. Uh, as an indirect skeptic, it makes a lot of sense to do them. But for this video, I wanted to do a different one. We tried a couple videos ago in one of our last proofs we did, uh, just proving it with the axioms, which we sometimes do. In this video, I want to do a conditional proof because a conditional is our main operator here, and it's actually going to be useful uh, to see that. And for people out there who like doing conditional proofs more than indirect proofs, hopefully it'll help them see how I would do that kind of a proof in this formal set theory kind of way. So, whew, with that out of the way, here's an assumed conditional proof. So we're assuming the first half of this. Note that because all of those variables are free, we're not going to be allowed to universally generalize any of them until we get out of this assumed conditional proof. So not until we're out of this line can we universally generalize any of them. We're allowed to assume them as free, but we're not allowed to generalize them until we're outside of the proof. Okay? So we're going to take this first half and we're going to try to prove the second half. So first off, we can simplify these nice and easy. A equals the set of C, B equals the set of D. And then we're going to do our definitions of our curly brackets, because this is really the only way we have to get rid of those curly brackets, to eliminate them and actually work with these concepts only in logical terms. So we'll use this. We only need the single version of it. Uh, we don't need a bunch of disjunctions in there. We just need E, which is the single one from the list of A1, A2, up to AN, and F, which is in place of B for that, and G, which is in place of C there. So we universally instantiate that to A and C and leave the G alone. This time we didn't change randomly the variable there. Uh, and we'll do it again to instantiate to B and D. Note we're kind of running these two in parallel uh, to just honestly, so it's easier for me to remember what I'm doing. Um, and hopefully it helps you see how these steps often mirror each other. Then we're going to take premise five and not do universal instantiation. I don't know where that came from. We're going to use the identity. So we're going to do actually, that should say premise five and premise two identity. Uh-oh, I hope there's not too many more mistakes in this. Uh, to get, for all G, G is a member of A, is materially equivalent to G equals C. The same mistake here, uh, probably copied and pasted. Um, for all G, G is a member of B, is materially equivalent to G equals D. That shouldn't be premise 6 universal instantiation. It should be premise 6 and premise 3 identity. Because we're basically using our 
equals sign in both of those as kind of like a implication or a modus ponens. We have the first half of it, so we can conclude the second half. Basically is what was going on, but we're actually replacing that with identity. So both of those should be identity. Apologies for the mistake. Uh, this is actually universal instantiation. So we instantiate G to being C. Why do we do that? Well, so we can very clearly get C as a member of A. And we instantiate G to being D for that one. So premise 8, universal instantiation, that's correct. Oh, but then we have all this nonsense to do with equivalents. So we're going to pull these long equivalent statements out. We're going to go ahead and simplify them to get C equals C implies C is a member of A. And D equals D implies D is a member of B. Well, it's pretty obvious C equals C and D equals D. We can conclude those just through the law of identity itself. And then use modus ponens on both of those to get C is a member of A and D is a member of B. Whew, that was a lot of work. So you may wonder why we did all of that. Basically what we were doing was we were trying to get our A equals bracket C bracket and B equals bracket D bracket into terms that we have a lot more rules to work with. We only really have one rule to work with our brackets, that's our curly definition. But we have a lot more rules that use membership. And so we needed to get those into a form we could really work with easily. All right. Now we're going to do a couple of assumed conditional proofs. So like I said, there's going to be some conditional proofs in a different way than we're normally doing them. To do this, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to prove this biconditional in the second half of the statement. We're trying to prove A equals B is materially equivalent to C equals D. Well, there's two ways to do that. We can prove a disjunction of both of those things or neither of those things, or we can prove two conditionals. A equals B implies C equals D, and C equals D implies A equals B. That second one is what we're going to try to do. So, A equals B, assume conditional proof, and then using premise 7, premise 19, and the law of identity, we can plug A in for B. So this... Is another mistake. Apologies. This should be premise 8, premise 19 identity because we're plugging into premise 8. We're switching out the B in premise 8 for an A because A equals B according to premise 19. That's what we're doing. We're not using premise 7 to be clear. And then we have from 20, C is a member of A is materially equivalent to C equals D. So we just instantiated G as C. And now we're going to use equivalence to split that apart and get our nice implication we were looking for, which is C is a member of A implies that C equals D. Well, we already have C is a member of A from premise 17. So premise 17, premise 23, modus ponens, gets us C equals D. Whew. So that seemed pretty easy. That was the first direction of our biconditional. But the other direction is going to be a lot harder. All right, so, and when you think about it, that should make sense because pulling things out of the curly brackets and saying if C equals D, then the whole set has to equal the whole other set is going to be harder than showing that if the whole sets are equal, then at least one of their members is equal, right? Hopefully that makes sense of why this should take longer. Okay, so we can say A equals B implies C equals D conditional proof. 19 through 24, pretty short. All right, but then oh, C equals D, assume conditional proof. Look how far that line goes. So we're going to assume that C equals D and try to prove then that A equals B. But uh-oh, we're going to need to do another assume conditional proof here. We're going to need to do a couple, actually, because to show that a full set equals another full set, we need to show that all of the members of each of those sets are equal. To do that, we need to use our axiom of extensionality and the parts of that axiom. This is one of those parts. We'll see the other one in a second. So we're trying to prove from this that X is a member of A implies that X is a member of B, and X is a member of B implies that X is a member of A. All right? So premise 7, universal instantiation. That is actually universal instantiation. Good. Uh, we're instantiating our G in that to the x that we have now. 
So we're just taking that and we're instantiating x in. You'll see why we're using an x later, but you could use a class variable for this. You don't have to use a set variable for it. Um, then we're going to split apart our equivalents, like we always have to do when we have that triple bar, into two conditionals. And then we'll simplify out the conditional that we need, which is x is a member of A implies that x equals C. We already had x is a member of A, so we get x equals C. Well, if x equals c, then x also equals d, because we had 26, c equals d. If x equals d, we can use identity again to show that x is a member of b from 1832 identity. So we've shown that if we assume x is a member of a, then x must be a member of b. So that was our conditional proof, 27 through 33. Now we're going to show it the other direction. And this is why we did all of that work at the beginning. If you thought in the first half with the assumed conditional proof, oh, we didn't really need to do all of the work for both of them, we did for this half. All right, x is a member of b. We're going to do basically the same routine we did earlier. So instead of premise seven, we're using premise eight this time, actually getting the right premise. Um, and then we'll split it apart with equivalents and simplify it down to the one half of those two biconditionals that we need which is that if x is a member of b, then x equals d. We get x equals d. We couldn't use the x equals d we had concluded from earlier because that was inside a different conditional proof. But we can still use the c equals d because that's in the larger conditional proof. You see how we're actually inside three conditional proofs. That's in the second level. It's like inception. You're just in levels upon levels of levels. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we can show that c x equals c and then x is a member of a and then we hear the music play and we go up a level no rien de rien. clearly this is a really long proof and i'm going a little crazy all right x is a member of b implies that x is a member of a from premise 35 through 41 conditional proof all right well we have both directions of this implication now so we can go ahead and conjoin them and then turn it into an equivalence a, x is a member of A is materially equivalent to X is a member of B. Well, now we can universally generalize this. Now, I want you to look closely at this because using universal generalization on a variable within a conditional proof is very dangerous. You can't have had that variable be free in the first line of this part of the conditional proof. And note, it was free in a couple parts of the conditional proof. In the last one we did at line 35, x is free, and the one we did before that in line 27, x is free. But look, we're only in the second, the, the second and the first level. We're not in either of those third level conditional proofs. And the first line of our second level proof is premise 26, which says c equals d. So we couldn't generalize c or d, but we can generalize x. And the first line of our big long proof has a, c, b, and d all free. So we couldn't generalize any of those, but it doesn't have an x. So we're allowed to generalize our x here. Just always be careful when you're using universal generalization inside either an indirect or a conditional proof. And then we're going to use our axiom of extension and universally general instantiate that axiom into this. So basically all of that work was to prove the first half of the axiom of extension. And then we'll just use modus ponens to get that A equals B. Whew, that was all we were trying to do since premise 26. And then we'll go ahead and do a conditional proof from 26 to 47. C equals D implies A equals B. I want to start playing the non rien de rien whenever we move outside of a proof now. Um, anyway, outside of one of those levels of a conditional or an indirect proof, especially in these conditionals where you just levels on levels on levels. Anyway, go read Gertel Escher Bach. All right. A equals B implies C equals D, and C equals D implies A equals B. Whew! Conjunction. So we've conjoined from premise 25 all the way back in premise 25 and premise 48. We've put them together, and this is going to turn into our equivalents. That should not be premise 25, premise 48 conjunction. It should say premise 49 equivalents, because uh, that's what we're doing. We're just turning two conditionals into an equivalent statement. And then from premises 1 through 50, conditional proof. 
Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, um, and we've proven that we need to do some universal generalizations. We're doing four universal generalizations in one step, generalizing D and then C and then B and then A. And we're allowed to do that once again, because we're outside of any conditional or indirect proof. So these variables were not free in the first line of this because there was no first line of this conditional or indirect proof. We've moved outside of the conditional proof. We're in the real world. We're no longer in the dream world anymore. Anyway, oh my goodness. Clearly have been making these videos too long. Okay, we have our conclusion for all A, for all B, for all C, and for all D. A equals the set of C and B equals the set of D implies that A equals B if and only if C equals D. Whew. Up next is the universe infinite. Somewhat spooky video for Halloween. Probably less spookier than most of our other Halloween videos, but you know, it's as spooky as set theory gets. <laughs> Watch this video and more here at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.